have come here to chew bubblegum and kick ass. And I'm all out of bubblegum. Go ahead. Make my day. Cinema Royale. Hello, everybody. This is Cinema Royale, and you can hear only my voice because I'm not going to be on webcam tonight because I am doing some things in my life, including moving, so I'm packing, and I don't want to be on camera at the moment. So, yes, welcome to Cinema Royale, where we keep it classy whenever we can. Let me introduce to all the co-hosts and our special guests tonight. First up, we got Matt Brunet, also known as Animat. Hey guys, and uh, I just want to mention this right now. If you got nothing to do, please go watch Kubo and the Two Strings. I kid you not. I, it's pretty much the best movie of the summer. Like, hands down. Just want to say that. Okay. okay. It looked good. I don't know if it's. I don't know if this video. I don't know if this video is going to be out but, uh, before my review, but uh, better better say it now than like until it's too late. You know. That's, that's always true. Sometimes I get it out late, sometimes I get it out early. Who knows? Next, right next to Matt is James Sullivan, also known as Hamitude. Tonight's broadcast is brought to you by Seth Rogen's uh, Talking Vagina Lips Hot Dog Bun. I watched your I watched your review. I know. That it's just I don't get that design. It's like why? He said, I talk like this and put some lipstick like on the a, other side of my hands. It's like a rule thirty. It's like a rule thirty-four version of the smog monster from Godzilla. So much sense is made now. And next up is our temporary cute co-host, Devin Cook. Hi everybody, yes I'm back from god knows how long I've been since on the last podcast, but I'm here, I'm cute, and I'm happy to be here. And Matt, I will still hurt you. For what? <laughs> I... You'll see. I'll still hurt you. And James, you're free. And Andy, you're free. Mike, you're always free. <laughs> oh, oh, man. And our guest tonight from foreign flick Andy Snyder greetings everyone it's foreign flicks so, I'm sorry jeez thank, thank messing you. it up <laughs> thank you always correct me because I mispronounce everything thank you thank you you're you're welcome I will leave a link to his stuff in the in the description <laughs> below so you can check his stuff out no matter what <laughs> don't mind me I am just ah uh, Anyways, tonight we are going to discuss all about British films, films from Britain itself, because we haven't had a discussion about international films in a long time since season one. We've talked about Canadian films. God damn. So, we are going to discuss five British films in particular. Some of us have not seen all of them, so we're just trying to recommend these movies, whether they are good or not as British films. So, and these are fine examples, this is like our, our guide to British films in general. I mean, in the UK, they're, they're not, they're kind of different than us in Hollywood, because they're just doing their own thing. Whether it's, you know, lots of variety, you know, there's comedy, whether it's like Monty Python, you know, animation, from like, uh, <laughs> uh no, 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 I, I'm not gonna correct you. I just want to see how you go in this. <laughs> God damn it! I forgot the name. <laughs> Shit. <laughs> Shit. What is the name of the company? <laughs> no, 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 I'll mention. I'll mention it when I talk about my movie. Damn it! You. I mean, okay, yeah, they did. <laughs> it's, like I said, it's unique to see what other countries do with their films. So let's just start off. <laughs> God damn it. Let's just start off with the animated choice, which one of the co-hosts here does not like whatsoever, so let's just start off with Chicken Run. Okay. Now, honestly, out of all the films made by Ardman... Thank you. Uh, <laughs> yes, Chicken Run always seems to be the one that really does stand out. I mean, like, uh, beforehand, let me just talk about a bit about Ardman. 
Uh, Arm and animation nowadays is considered the most popular and like the most popular and the most beloved animation studio in the UK, uh, mainly for their artistic style and having um, pretty much like in-house, well-known uh, animation directors and very known like animation uh, icons in a way. Uh, you already got like Peter Lord, David Sproxton, and you got Nick Park. Uh, especially, you know them very well for. Uh, a, a lot of their well-known projects, um, especially with Wallace and Gromit. But then they decided they wanted to enter into feature films. And this attempt is with Chicken Run, which Nick Park decided to step in. Before he really wanted to go into a Wallace and Gromit movie, he wants to try to test out the waters a bit with Chicken Run. And my god, I remember having such a blast when watching this film. It really is a lot of fun. Now, um, one thing I will say is that the animation itself, like, of course it does have that signature Nick Park style where, like, you got, like, the beady like, the beady eyes on top and, like, the weird, like, elongated mouth, uh, pretty much like Wallace, uh, the way he's designed. But, uh, with Chicken Run, what, what actually is amazing is mostly... This is kind of a connection between, it's kind of like an interaction between uh, the UK and the US because basically the whole plot is basically, it's, it's, a prison, it's, a prison, it's a prison break movie. Basically the chickens are all uh, caged up and uh, they would actually be sent to turn into chicken pies, which pretty much they'd be dead. So they want to find a way to escape. Uh, one of which is actually an American rooster who claims that he could fly, voiced by Mel Gibson, uh, Mel Gibson by the way. So ba basically the whole point of this movie is to try their best to pretty much find a way to go out and like get out of the farm so that they can finally escape and be free or else they would be turned into pies. And honestly it's just a fantastic parody of, um, of prison, uh, like prison escape films like uh, The Great Escape and stuff like that, but going back to uh, what I was referring to, to the like the like the cultural differences with the U.S. and the U.K. is that you could tell like um, like when uh, the uh, hold on let me let me just get uh, get a bit of info here uh, when the rooster who came in Rocky well like when he would come into the scene he was he he's like the new hotshot foreigner and um, <laughs> like pretty much like it it really does present how like outside of the U.S. it's kind of like this. Um, how often America can be represented uh, represented as a magical place until like you actually know some of the truth about it, and uh, a lot and you can tell how a lot of these characters have their own charm. Um, oh my God! I mean, there there there's definitely uh, there's definitely a lot of them like a uh, Ginger, and uh, you know Fe uh, Fetcher, Mac, uh, Mr. and Mrs. Tweety. Uh, definitely surprisingly like. Uh, pretty funny and threatening villains, but you pretty much got an entire great cast. Uh, just want to pick out a few, actually. Uh, one of my personal favorites, we, like, we also got Babs. Babs is absolutely hilarious. <laughs> it's kind of like, um, kind of like your typical old, like, British old lady. It's like, this is going on all the day. I don't want to be a pie. My life is flashing before my eyes. It's actually very boring. Uh, ba Babs would always be one of my favorites. Um, I do want uh, to be a pie, but I do yeah, like gravy. I do like gravy. Uh, what? I'm trying to figure out what else. But um, uh, no. But there, there, there are definitely a. Gr there's definitely a great large cast, and uh, especially like with the main character, I believe is uh, Ginger. You can definitely tell like. There, there's a lot, like, you could tell with that character, there's a lot of determination, a lot of high spirit to go and escape in there. You could tell, like, she does care about, about uh, the chickens around her and to have freedom. But it's, and also, I just want to mention about the animation. It's absolutely top notch. And uh, really, one of the, mo one of the hot, one of the highlights uh, in terms of technical innovation with what, of what they did at Arnman, especially with scenes where, like, no matter what, rather it be like they're training the chickens or like they're trying to make them fly, or especially when Rocky and Ginger are in the are in that machine 
that would turn chicken into pies. It's definitely amazing, and it, it definitely adds a bit of intensity to the movie as well. Since it is like a prison escape scene, you will admit, like, there will be some times where things can get pretty, like, you know, like, like the heat is up, and, you know, it, it'll grab you and be on the edge of your seats to make sure that they don't escape. But, yeah, I would say overall with Chicken Run, it is absolute, it's definitely an absolutely hilarious film, uh, absolutely beautifully animated film, and overall just all-around fun. And one more thing, one more thing I want to add before uh, I pass it off to others is that it is all thanks to this movie why the Academy Awards actually have the nomination for be uh, the category for Best Animated Feature. Considering that mm. one of the biggest goals mm. for Chicken Run was that they wanted to go and get nominated for Best Picture. Because during that time, that has never happened. Like, an, an animated feature to be legitimately nominated for Best Picture since Disney's Beauty and the Beast. But unfortunately, that didn't happen. But the Academy really did notice the effort that ch that they put in onto Chicken Run, and like they did feel a little bit guilty. So to compensate for that, they decided to go and create the category of best animated uh, best animated feature. Which, uh, thankfully for Ardman, they would actually win the award uh, a few years later with Wallace and Gromit: The Curse of the Were Rabbit, another amazing uh, animated feature from Ardman Animation. So yeah. That's basically my say on Chicken Run. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember when this movie came out. Um, one of the one of the craziest things that they they had about it was uh, the um, uh, the advertisement, uh, the advertising campaign. They at least as far as in the U.S. they they had regular advertisements, regular trailers and whatnot, and then they had. The bizarre choice to have advertisements that were spoofing other movies that were out at the time, uh, like um, uh, like uh, like Gladiator and uh, and Mission Impossible too, they just have these trailers in there for Chicken Run that were edited in the style of those other trailers. Mm -hmm. And it, it like was something that you would have to you'd have to go back and rewatch the the trailer for Gladiator to sort of get the joke, but it would just be like the chicken that the egg that hatched the chicken, the chicken that hatched the plan. Uh, and of course, uh, with the Mission Impossible, when they have all these uh, all these really juicy explosions going all over the place with all the actors' names, Mel Gibson, Jane Horrocks. Yeah, I mean, like, nowadays, that's kind of the, like, norm. nowadays, that is a bit of the norm in terms of advertising. Like, you would see, you would see it all the time when um, movies would go and, like, movies, especially, like, comedies, family films, and animated flicks, uh, they would go and, ad like, they would go and have fun, like, trying to make parodies of, like, some of the films from the past or, like, what happened in recent years. I mean, the best example of that is not just with uh, what they did with Chicken Run, but also with uh, Lilo and Stitch, when, like, their campaign at the beginning was, like, um, they would take iconic moments from uh, the, from, uh, the Disney Renaissance, like Aladdin, Beauty and the Beast, Little Mermaid, oh, wow. and then suddenly Stitch would come in and screw the whole scene up. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. I always remember. Well... Yes, as Mike hinted, I'm the only one that doesn't like this movie. <laughs> I, when, okay, I will admit, when it came out, I was, I was probably, I was, I remembered seeing the commercials for it, and I went, this looks stupid. I didn't even see it. I thought, this is a terrible idea. I was not interested. And something about the animation to me, and as a kid, looked too creepy for me. So I avoided it at all costs. <laughs> I had a funny, I didn't like Ardman's animation, and I started to figure that out as I got older. Um, yeah, I will hurt you, Matt. Just remember <laughs> that. Nobody grins like that, but it's harmless. I'm sorry, that looks like Satan is about to kill me, and it looks like you are about to kill me. Put that goddamn thing away. <laughs> Boy. <laughs> I will beat you with my iPad, Matt. 
Okay. Matt, don't you start. Okay, let her let the girl speak. Yeah, right, because fine. then after that I will kick his ass. But um after when I got older and like I saw like everybody was hyping, it's a great comedy and this is you should check it out. Don't let it put parents to school, you blah 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 blah. I get it. And there are movies that are so overhyped. That's the greatest comedies. And yet here I am going, what the fuck is so funny about it? And I will name two examples right now. I always think mm. of these two. Emperor's New Groove and Chicken Run. Two of the stupidest movies I have seen. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't like either movie. And I just... But I will say this. Like, as far as Chicken Run is concerned, the animation does look good. I'm not going to deny that. Armin does have a good job with animation. I'm not going to trash their animation. I've seen worse. But I don't. the one thing I don't like about this movie, I don't like any of the characters. Like, the only one I could tolerate was Ginger, and I thought she was, like, a very determined, yeah, like Matt said, very determined, very high-spirited chicken. But well, you're supposed to like her, not just I, tolerate her. You know, you're yeah, you're right. You're supposed to. But I'm sorry. Something about that voice actress. I I think part of my problem is I don't like any of the voice actors that voiced any of the characters. That might be part of the problem. Maybe I am too American in that way. Um, I though I should have liked Rocky, but I really can't stand him. He reminded me way too much of Cusco, and that's why I wanted to punch him in the freaking face. You're saying that like it's a bad thing. It is a bad thing. For me. Well, we yeah, were having exactly. this conversation. Well, we were having this conversation uh, before, uh, beforehand. I, I explained, yeah, the uh, the character uh, Rocky Rhodes is is uh, a, a stereotypical, uh, uh, overly American. arrogant. Uh, I, I was just thinking, not even American character, just a just a. He, he's kind of like this. Uh, he's kind of uh, their their version of Johnny Bravo and Zach Brannigan. But um, <laughs> uh, the difference here is what works with him is that he has a he has a character arc. You know, he starts out he's very he's very disrespectful towards uh, towards the other characters, specifically Ginger. You know, he's calling her doll face and all this, and he's I I, I couldn't rem. I remember when first seeing this, the movie. Uh, the one moment I, I was just like, "This is a kids' movie, right?" When they're when they're doing stretches and he come comes up behind her and he's checking her ass out. You, no, oh, you know what? I'm not going to comment on that. But there, I don't. There, I don't like arrogant, annoying, pain in the ass characters, especially boys and men. I don't know why. That is a huge nitpick of my I cannot get into certain movies because of that. I can't. Like, Kusto one of them. Kusto and Tarn are two examples. Can I, I have a question. You yeah. said that there are some pain in the ass characters. Which one, is, which one is the one that is more resemblance to, that's more resembled to me? I was gonna say, well, Rocky probably. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much! Thank you very much! I'm here till Thursday. <laughs> I, I, see, I don't know why you're just that rare exception, even though I want to kill you and kick your ass. <laughs> Mainly just mm -hmm. kick your ass. But I don't get into characters like that very much. They annoy me. I I don't like like they yeah, that really bothers me on a personal level. It's sort of a, and that... like I, they, let me finish. Mm -hmm. Like I said, Sorry. it sort of reminded me of sort of. Not exactly. I still think Tarn's the worst character I've ever seen in an animated feature, but um, he reminded me way too much of Cusco, and that was my biggest problem. I don't, I like, I don't mind characters with story arcs. That's fine. But here's the problem with that stereotype. The problem is, they are so arrogant, you don't like them. But then when they do change, so I don't believe it. I don't believe it at all. I have, like, 
I, if you, but if you make me watch one of these movies, I have no belief that they even changed. Even though the movie is telling you they did, I don't believe it. And I, and it's impatient, it's intolerable, and it annoys me to bits. That's why I don't like certain formulas, like, like oh yeah, the, like the buddy comedy formula. I don't get into it very much. I have rare exceptions. I do have rare exceptions, but it's. I just don't like that stereotype very much at all. And I remember, like, I could. I, the only character I actually remember from Chicken Run, even though I just watched it, in, like, literally a couple hours ago. No, not even that. Not even an hour ago. And I barely remember it. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah. That's, that's the type of. That's when I saw it, like, a couple years ago. Literally an hour later, I had to think about what did I just watch? I couldn't tell you. And it felt the same way as it did before. I couldn't remember anything. And I still don't remember very much from the film at all. I couldn't tell you lines, I couldn't tell you jack shit. And, yeah, that's pretty sad. And it just, and I'm not saying that Ardman can't make good movies. They do. They, I'm just not a fan of their style. I don't get into it very much. Hell, the, the probably the only Ardman film that I actually really liked was Pirate's Band of Misfits. And that was more slapsticky. That was more my type of humor. But British humor, or at least with Wallace and Gromit and Curse of the Were Rabbit and Chicken Run, that's more of a British subtle humor that I just do not get into very much. I like. So why are you here? <laughs> oh, I. She. <laughs> Matt. <laughs> you know what? Are you ready to? <laughs> <laughs> I'm just asking. You're saying that you don't like. You're not I the don't. kind that enjoys British British humor and British style filmmaking. So why are sorry. You a, why are you in a Cinema Royale episode in which we talk about it? Hey, I had a rare exception, which I will talk about later. But I'm just pointing that out. That I'm, most of the time I don't like it, but I have my exception, which I will be talking about. Later. Which should be chicken. You know, I, Mike, can you punch him for me? Because he's trying to piss me off. <laughs> Matt, what? Don't do that. Don't tick her. Do off. what? Don't tick her off. God, <laughs> then I won't even have you on the podcast no more. You keep it up. Oh, <laughs> oh really? He's the off. only re- He's the only reason we have an audience. Okay, touche. <laughs> I just don't want this to be like a big argument. I mean, I'm not making it a big argument. It's, it's not. I'm not you just I'm having not, fun. I know you are. I know. <laughs> Matt, you're getting this for the rest of the night. As and for, trust me, there are there are things that I am restraining myself from. So and I can go a lot farther to prove her wrong. So as, as for me, Chicken Run. I remember watching it as a kid. It was I was like 10, 11 years old when it came out, so I remember watching it as a kid. I it's been a while since I've seen it, but I kind of enjoyed it. I've seen his uh, Ardman's other works too, and it's just it's unique uh, animation style, and I thought it was unique for the time. And yes, British humor is very subjective, like all other kind of humor, because you know the Brits have different sense of humor than Americans do, you know. So I can understand what Devin's coming from with that point. Um, Thank you. They well, they had, I, they had stuff in there that I that I, I didn't think was too far off from American films. I mean, there's a reason why there's a reason why Ardman was compared was being very heavily compared to Pixar around that time because they were they were very strong competition with each other. When when uh, when uh, Pixar made Toy Story. Oh, one of their uh, they the climax in that with the with the with the moving truck and the pacing and everything. Uh, what they had in mind was um, the wrong trousers with uh, uh, with Wallace and Gromit, and uh, uh, they said, "How? Uh, where? This is our this is our competition right to here. This is how." how tough it's getting we need to be better than this and i sort of i sort of got that 
the feeling around this time that um, yeah the 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 formulas and overall feel of the films were pr very similar except one was British and had clay and the other one was computer graphics mostly well, and you know um, one interesting thing I would like to add regarding Chicken Run is that um, maybe it would say you know maybe this would say something regarding uh, stop motion animated features nowadays but interestingly enough after all these years Chicken Run still remains as the highest grossing stop motion animated film of all time uh, close to 200 million actually wow yeah, it's a bit disappointing because, um, like, it is sad to know because th there are a lot of great stop, uh, like, you know, there are a lot of great stop motion animated films, uh, like I said, well, yeah, there are a lot of great stop, recent stop motion animated films that have been released, like, uh, movies like Cor uh, like Coraline and Wallace and Gromit Curse of the Were-Rabbit are considered classics, um, mm. like, even, uh, like, like I said, even like I said before, Kubo and the Two Strings was a phenomenal film and honestly the best the best movie of the summer. And uh, rather if it's going to top the charts at the box office, I highly doubt it. But my God, it, it was definitely worth it. But yeah, like um, it is sad to know that you know stop motion films don't really get as much attention, even though the, the budget is not as big. Like even though like they do get their money's worth, considering that the budget is not usually that big. But um, yeah, like, you know, at least it's worth something for Chicken Run to actually gain $200 million. Yeah. Oh. Where a rabbit. I, I'm actually with Devin on that one. I think I think Wallace and Gromit are, were typically stronger doing the short formula. See, I actually do... I have seen a couple of those Grom Wallace and Gromit shorts, and I thought they were good. I liked them. I enjoyed the shorts, but I didn't care for the movie at all. And it's Thank not really... you. <laughs> I mean, I'm not saying that Armin is a bad studio. I'm actually not. I actually highly... I do admire them for doing something completely different. But is it my type of movies? No. I'm not really into their movies very much. The only one, like I said, Pirates Band of Misfits was more my style of humor. And, and I'm not... And I don't completely hate British humor, and I don't completely hate British style <laughs> filmmaking, Matt. But, you know, She's only saying that now. Cause but let's you, see. You pissing me off. But, <laughs> as I'm saying, <laughs> I like I said, I do have a film that I will talk about why I really like it, but, um... I have some exceptions, and I'm not, and I've had, and more of them are live action and not animated as far as Britain is concerned. It's more live action. I am more of an American, like I love, or more of an American animation person than British. I'm more American. Well, you know, I could prove a point, but I don't, but I do want to hurt you later, Matt. <laughs> uh, when was the last time a great when was the last time a great animated movie came out of Canada? Oh. <laughs> well, technically a lot. Well, technically a lot of them are made in Canada. Come on. Would Sausage Party count as one? What? <laughs> <laughs> what was the greatest animation studio from? That is well known today. One of them. In Canada? No, I'm talking about in America. America? America? <laughs> what? We're talking about British films. Why are you, why are you going with America? <laughs> hey, I'm just pointing out my... <laughs> I am just pointing out my... <laughs> so... So, Devin, do you want to talk about your film now, or do you want to go a little bit later? I will wait. Okay. I want everyone else to talk because before I'm half tempted to kill Matt. <laughs> I'll let you cool off a bit. Um, but, at the, but at the end of the day, go watch Chicken Run. Great movie. You, everyone else who likes this movie, good for you. But Matt, you can fuck this. <laughs> okay. Um, we're gonna go backwards in time from 2000. 
to a couple years back, actually, to 1998, to be exact, with Guy Ritchie's Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Andy? <laughs> yes, Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Gosh, so way back when I saw Snatch first, which was his follow-up to Lock, Stock, mm -hmm. uh, that was the, sort of the big, popular, Americanized version, practically, uh, that had, you know, Brad Pitt and uh, Dennis Farina in it. Uh, but before that, it was this lower quality in terms of visual style. Uh, caper, dark comedy uh, that, for all intents and purposes, was made by a bunch of nobodies. Uh, you know, Guy Ritchie didn't even go to film school. Uh, he had, you know, worked his way up through the film industry and created this, what I think is a uh, brilliant uh, caper comedy, for lack of better words. Um, and so it sort of takes qualities that we might have seen before from Tarantino. I've seen some comparisons to Tarantino with, like, Pulp Fiction, you know, where you're interweaving all of these different different criminal elements together. Um, but it's yeah. a very different type of film than what Tarantino does. Uh, well, and well... Tarantino is the only other director I could think of who would probably think about beating someone to death with a dildo, but... Uh... <laughs> that does seem very Tarantino-esque, yes. <laughs> uh, and so, I mean, the, the basic story is, you know, we're following these four friends who are sort of low-level criminals. You know, a couple of them are street grifters. One of them's like a card shark. Uh, they pull together $100,000 to enter into this game with a... a well-known gangster in the area they lose big end up owing owing them a lot of money and have to pay it back and at the same time you know their their neighbors are looking to rob a group of pot dealers and so the four friends then plan to rob their neighbors once they're done robbing the pot dealers and so it it all sort of ties together in the end and i don't want to really spoil anything for anyone that hasn't seen it uh, but weaving these various stories there's I think it's all at like five different storylines that in the end weave together and they're all connected. Uh, you know, there's very funny interactions, uh, but it's that typical British, like dry humor. You know, it's nothing, you know, laugh out loud, funny. It's just this clever, dark comedy. And uh, it also introduced us to a couple of big names. Now, uh, Jason Statham and Vinnie Jones, who prior to that, I mean, Jason Statham was, I guess, a, a driver at the time, and Vinnie Jones was known as a, a footballer with a violent attitude. Um, and so hmm. the world uh, gave us those two guys who now, I mean, they're they're huge stars in the U.S. And Guy Ritchie, of course, went on to make Snatch and the Sherlock Holmes films with uh, Robert Downey Jr. Yeah. Yeah, I remember Vinnie Jones. His career was taken down with four words. I'm the juggernaut, bitch. <laughs> oh, God, that movie was so terrible. Uh... <laughs> Guilty pleasure on my end. I, the, the later X-Men movies were worse. Some of them. But, um, but yeah, at Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, I, I saw that when, when I came out on DVD... That was a that was a thing in 1999, you know, 1998, 99. DVD was this new format. It was coming out and it was really popular and it was kind of like, "Whoa, this movie's clean looking on DVD." Uh, but um, but yeah, I I have a bit of a confession to make. I only have vague memories of it because I think during the time we watched it we watched it um we watched it we watched it with the sound off because uh because there was some some uh, issue between uh, the dvd player and the tv set and uh, uh and so i was just watching the whole thing with closed captioning on not really all that fun <laughs> oh but i God. do but i do remember a bunch of guys getting high and one, there's there's that one spectacular sequence where they're all partying together, and it they do something really neat. Um, 
uh, where they they uh, they show these guys partying. It speeds up, rapidly goes through the party, and then it slows down when something big is about to happen. Like you know, one guy feels so good he's just like, I'm gonna do a backflip. <laughs> and uh, that was kind of it was it was around that time where even though that even though like you say that that film was sort of low and gritty and whatnot and nobody knew knew these guys uh there was that time when when speeding up and slowing down film was sort of popularized by the matrix and these guys just sort of tried their hand but hand at doing a a cheaper version of that effect which i thought uh which i thought for that particular scene was kind of nice to look at I mean, it was like, whoa, what's going on here? This is very surreal. Yeah, it really captured the uh, party atmosphere quite well, I would say. Mm hmm. Um, but yeah. Vinny, Vinny Jones? I, yeah. I did. I mean, this, uh, I think this has one of my favorite scenes of his ever and it's probably the most uh i guess emotion i've seen out of the guy acting wise uh which is probably because it's his natural habitat where he's smashing a guy's head into a car door <laughs> after the guy like threatens his son uh he just mercilessly is just like slamming his head into a car door not that we see it it's not graphic or anything uh that's probably the most expressive acting i've seen out of Vinnie jones huh. and it's just in his first film wow. well well, that, well, that and Euro Trip, but um... <laughs> yes, again, probably playing himself. Uh... Yeah, my sister actually met Vinnie Jones. Uh, funny enough, there was a, a years ago, I think, when she was going to college, uh, there was a, there was um, a race. Uh, uh, there was this uh, celebrity stock car race going on and he was one of the drivers and they had to, and they had to um, uh, they they hired on these uh, these girls to you know make some of the stock car drivers uh, uh, look good like they're hanging on with hanging out with girls and whatnot and my sister who by the way is uh, uh, has an MBA and uh, a, a five-digit salary now, um, and and uh, she's married happily and everything. This was during a time, uh, you know, she was she's always been very outgoing, so she just sort of decided to be one of these uh, cute girls that um, uh, that the stock car celebrity racers get to pal around with, and she said. She said this about Vinny Jones. Um, ah, man, it was so long ago. But he he was actually very much a gentleman to her. So whatever you're, you know, he yeah he was he's just saying stuff like my girl and whatnot. It, this sort of being very polite and very British in a sense, and. Um, so yeah, the the character that he puts on in movies like T Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels, it's it's very interesting typecasting because he looks like that. He looks like the type of person that could just explode. He plays that well on screen, but um... yeah. Interestingly enough, the the first day of filming for Lock, Stock. Uh, he was just mm -hmm. released from police custody for assaulting his neighbor. So he literally is that kind of guy that apparently could just fly off the handle. Uh, I mean, that, again, that was, that was, you know, in the mid 90s, so things have possibly changed for him. But back then, he was definitely much more of a hothead. Okay. That, that would make sense now. I mean, maybe there's a, maybe there's sort of a publicity side uh, that, you have to get used to also when you're an, when you're an actor you know put on a certain attitude yeah i love uh lock stock at first 
I honestly preferred Snatch. I mean, that was just the sort of easier one to to watch. I mean, the accents aren't quite as as heavy. Uh, so from an American perspective, not used to hearing British accents all the time. Uh, I know the first time I watched Lockstock, I had a much harder time following what was happening because they speak with like the the Cockney uh, rhyming slang, yes. uh, which if you haven't heard is very complicated. Uh, if you don't know anything about it, you can kind of be thrown for a loop and not know what people are talking about. Um, but once you get used to it, it's a little easier to follow. And you know, upon further viewings of Lockstock, that has definitely become one of my favorites uh, to come out of Britain. Yeah, it's especially when you watch Britain films, their their accents are so thick you cannot understand what they're saying sometimes. Especially with my film I was watching, it was just like sometimes like, What did he say? Huh? What? <laughs> that sort of thing. It was just I can understand that. Um oddly enough, the movie was so popular it spawned off a TV series. Yeah. I heard about that. I haven't seen any of it, but I I did see uh when I was researching my review, which I did a video review, a uh, quick plug, I guess. Uh, my last Foreign Flicks video review was for Lock, Stock, and Two Smoking Barrels. Uh, so I did come across that. i uh, be curious to see what kind of show they would make out of this. I am mean, reading up on it now, and it's just interesting. It didn't last long. It lasted a pilot in six episodes on Channel 4. Hmm. But of course, it mentions about the, the rhyming slang of London's East End and how its viewers are hard to comprehend all that and so it's like what in bloody hell is he talking about <laughs> but yeah I've it's interesting I don't know there's, there's a way to find it if you interested it's on DVD huh eh, oh. you can buy it on DVD I'll have to look that up yeah it'd be interesting to see mm-hmm. what that would be like I just thought that was interesting because sometimes a lot of TV to uh, movies is just or movie to TV is usually a different transition because it's interesting to see what the difference is between the two turn out to be and who the recast because of course you can't get the regular cast to come back for a show oh yeah I like that uh, Turner and Hooch TV show <laughs> it lasted only a pilot and you <laughs> oh god <laughs> I'm sorry because the Turner and Hooch pilot had Tom F. Wilson, who we made it was Biff from Back to the Future, as Turner <laughs> instead of Tom Hanks. This is so funny seeing <laughs> seeing it's just like, oh god, doesn't he? Ugh. Anyway. Yep, moving forward. Yes, moving forward. Let's hop two years even further in the past in ninety six with train spotting, James. What do you got? Well, um, Train Spotting was uh, uh, was a uh, was a film actually that um, I, I that I remember I remember back uh, uh, after shortly after its release was um, kind of a. A, a little independent film that uh, that struck a, a big a big chord and it's a it's a it's a movie about a bunch of guys in in Scotland uh, who are all friends who are all heroin addicts and uh, and um, that was one thing that actually threw me off at first is is um, I didn't uh, I, when it when they actually said in the movie it takes it take takes play take the little takes place in Scotland, I had to look it up again. I was like, does this technically count as a UK movie? I looked at the certification. Yes, UK. I was like, okay, I'm cool. Um, and uh, uh, Ewan McGregor in one of his earliest, uh, most popular on screen roles plays the lead here a guy named Fenton who thanks to a lot of pressure um, really 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 wants to get off heroin and he uh, he tries uh, he tries a number of different things Uh, he tries uh, taking this special pill that he's uh, prescribed and 
what what ends up happening is um, it's a little bit more than it, it's a movie that deals heavily with with drug addiction and the atmosphere in which uh, you know people become addicted, um, which I find fascinating only because uh, you know the author was not a drug addict. That, the author of the book on which it was based was not a drug addict themselves, but it really seemed to this this film, uh, from uh, from what I've seen of uh, you know drug uh, drug habits and whatnot, this really this film really seemed to sort of capture that atmosphere. I've been to I'm, I've never been on drugs myself, but um, uh, I I have been to some some parties in the past you know i went to college stories i could tell and here yeah this this movie portrays uh nail it sort of nails this idea that it's not just the drug in and of itself but it's also the atmosphere you know he doesn't he doesn't stay off heroin very long at first because you know he's still hanging out with the same people his uh, the same friends and everything and and um, it's it, it's kind of a, a very starkly captured um, uh, kind of kind of comical in a quirky sense but also at the same time a very very much a, a tragic portrayal of uh, of the uh, the drug world, um, and Mike and I were watching this movie together. I I remember the first time the first time that I that I actually saw this movie, uh, or I, I never actually saw it, but first time I heard about it, first time I heard about it, I remember sitting down in high school. Uh, uh, listening to these uh, listening to these uh, girls talk about the movie and both of these girls were drug addicts you know they they were on they, they'd, they'd done some hard stuff you know beyond marijuana and all that and they were talking about this movie and it's like oh, oh yeah that this this movie's really funny it's like it's just like uh, they got a scene in there where a guy dives into a toilet and comes back out again. It's 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 great, you know. And yes, that is a scene in the film. That is a highlight very early on. If you want to see Ewan McGregor on a, on a heroin trip, diving into a toilet, this is this is that film. But I I don't think they were tr quite grasping the message of the film. Ironically enough. I don't know what uh, what do you have to say about it, Mike? Well, I don't really. Uh, it was an interesting film. I watched it with James uh, early this week, and it it was unique because it was a it's a personal story about, like you said, a drug addict, and it's trippy. They're, the toilet scene alone, I was like, I was gagging because there was so much shit on the floor in that bathroom. Oh my god. Ah. Oh. Uh, yeah. Ah, oh, so gross. And there's that whole like that drug trip, you know, where he's in, he's trying to recover from the hospital when he almost died. You know, you see mm -hmm. you see the there's so many imagery. It's unbelievable. Like. It's, it's it's too much at one point. Like he, it's oh, it's hard to explain because this film just mi li like mind fucked me. Like I couldn't understand what was going on so much. But I can understand, you know, from drug addicts. You know, it's just like this is a story about how it's a, it kind of remind me of Clockwork Orange in a way where it's like a alternate version where it's all about drugs instead of crime, and it's just like. But he's with his droogs, you know, he's hanging out, doing some crazy fucked up shit, and, you know, is just on heroin. Yep. 
Mm -hmm. um, uh, the thing... Uh, oh, what was that? There's a scene where he returns to heroin after trying to wean off it, you know, trying to get help with it, and he, and he dies. He dies, and the way they show it is that he takes the hit, and he's on the floor, and he sinks into the floor, and there's like this red, like, carpet or rug that covers him, and you see it, it mm -hmm. through a POV shot, the whole red around the edge is like he's dying, and you see him being transported from the place, through the hospital, and it's just interesting to see the POV of each little spot. I was like, oh, that's kind of creative, actually. That's interesting. Yeah, he's... Yeah, even though he's being dragged, he's being uh, dragged around by people uh, who are, you know, trying to trying to revive him or or at least get rid of him or whatnot. Uh, you get it, it's it's sort of this motif that suggests he's he's one foot in the grave or literally six feet under. Yeah, it was like that was kind of creative because this is the director of Danny Boyle who you may know from his other works, like um, Slumdog Millionaire, he's done Trance, he's... Um, 28 Days Later? Yes, yep, 28 Days Later, yes. So he's, this is his, in his early career, you know, doing this independent stuff in the UK, and it's just interesting to see how he progresses over time. There's there's, there's some uh, trademarks you see later on in the films, like you s at the beginning of the film, you see a scene that's in the middle of the film later on. So they, she starts from the middle at the beginning, and then it catches you up to the point to that happens. And it's just like, okay, it's I can see the see when I watch movies, I see it through like a tentacle kind of level, like deep down behind the scenes kind of stuff and see how he shoots things in different angles. And it's like, okay, that's pretty cool. There's some shots that are pretty cool. It's tragic too. It's a tragic story. Like there's one point where there's a chick who's on heroin mm. and she has a baby, and there's a scene where you see the baby and he's, the baby's dead. Not, the baby's he's not. <laughs> yeah, he he's he's not been fed, in a while. Yeah, the baby's just like, neglected and just boom dead. And you see that corpse and it's like, <laughs> yeah ah ah. ah. Like, oh yeah, we God. usually talk a lot during during movies. Sometimes I'll, I'll mm -hmm. I've gotten to the bad habit of making jabs and whatnot. Mm -hmm. That that was just sort of a moment where you're just like, I'm not gonna say anything. No, it is is like, shit. Uh, so you don't you, you. But then the amazing thing is, right after right afterward, you know, the the lady's been screaming for hours and hours and hours on end. She comes to and she just says. I need a hit. Yeah, she's like, I need a hit. They will calm me down. Yeah, and that was... And and I started thinking, you know what? There's one addiction that I've always had. I'm a, I'm a gaming addict. I'm a gamer. That's my that's my hit right there. It's a, it's a terrific dr anti-drug. Yeah. You know what? You know, why not, why not play something... Uh, as opposed to, but anyway, uh, I noticed a very similar pattern. Like some, like you know, I sat back and thought after that. I said, well, sometimes after, if I get hard news in my life or something like that, sometimes I'll sit back and say, I need to play a game. Yeah, it just makes you think about addiction in general. Like, it's it's a it's, mm -hmm. a, it's a film that is full of drug use and weird imagery but deep down it has a message about addiction and the a person who's going through it mm -hmm. and I thought that was interesting about the movie and yes like James says based on a novel and guess what Danny Boyle is coming back to the film with a sequel called T2 Transpotting 2 which is coming out next year sometime so it's interesting to see where they go with it because there's another I think they're loosely basing it on the second novel that he wrote called Porno and it's not going to be called Porno because it's just it's bait 
basically the sequel is going to be based around the guys coming back after like 10 years I believe and it's based around porn they're like around the porn kind of industry you know kind of thing like looking at porn instead of drugs so I'm kind of interested to see what they do with the sequel yeah I had no idea I had no idea even after watching the movie why it was called train spotting uh, I think there was one point where Mike and I looked uh, we looked up um, you know, on Google why is it called train spotting and it and apparently there's a portion in the novel where they go they go to a train station and something that was removed in this adaptation was uh, some some uh, some guy uh, passes by them and uh, these uh, Fenton and his and his pals and he's just like, "What are you boys doing? Train spotting?" It was like some sort of joke and yeah. whatnot. And I'm like, "Well, what the heck does that mean? Are you looking for a train? Is that that what this movie is about looking for a train?" And then someone act someone over Facebook actually when I made a post about the film uh, put it pretty bluntly to me um, imagine if you will you're on a you're on a set of train tracks and you spot the train coming oh. that's that's what they mean by train spotting is that you need to spot the train before you get hit by it Eesh. Harsh. Mm hmm. And, uh, yeah, they. There are scenes in the film. It it, it, it doesn't just get tragic. It, there's, there's one scene in the film straight out of a. Straight out of a David Lynch horror movie. Uh, he's, uh. The second, the second time he's recuperating from heroin, uh, he has this. There's this scene where he Fenton's in bed mm -hmm. at his parents' house. They've locked him in there, no drugs, not even not even anything to to wean him off yeah. from the hospital or anything like that. And he's, oh, he's uh, hallucinating. He's, he's just hallucinating. He starts, he's hallucinating. Everyone in the movie pops up and and says something to him. His friends are like crawling along the walls. And then he looks up on the ceiling, and the the dead baby is crawling across the ceiling. Oh, is, oh, is that where it came from? Yes. Oh, dear. Yes, it, you may have heard of that scene before too. Yeah, that just I was like, what the hell am I watching? It's just like the baby's like ah, climbing on the ceiling, he's like, and. and, and He's like, no, 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 don't come by me, don't come by me, no. Yeah, talk about talk about overacting, but I, I'm really glad that Ewan McGregor, I, I thought he was great in this movie. Um, I think that it was it's stuff like this, you know. Eventually, this led on to, you know, Star Wars and and all the other stuff in his career that he was really he was really known for him, Moulin Rouge. Um, I think this was a, a good kick start. A good way to start his career was, was this movie. It was a, a great... It was a great display of his talents. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. It's, uh, Train Spotting is actually a really decent uh, movie if you want to get into addiction and drugs and the mind of a drug addict. It's pretty out there. It's a great cast, too. I mean, not only Ewan McGregor, but just other kind of familiar faces. Like, I was watching, and I was like, I know that guy. I know that guy, too. Like, um... Yeah, there's Robert Carlyle is yeah. in the movie. Robert yeah. Carlyle, yeah. Yeah, he's... Around. Rumpelstiltskin. Yeah, I was like... <laughs> That's right. <laughs> yeah, I was like, yeah, he's in this. I was like, damn. And then there's, like, this one obscure one. I was like, there's Jake, um, Johnny... Lee Miller, who is, um, he's currently, the new Sherlock. yeah, the new yeah. Sherlock in elementary, and I was like, what, d d d what, 
<laughs> that, that he's in train spotting. I mean, he's got this goofy like punk haircut. Yeah, it's very actually train spotting is very punk too. Cause like all oh, looks, it's like he's got all his hair stuck up and he's all into Bond. Yes, this guy, he plays. <laughs> he's into Bond. Like he, he talks about Bond with his friends, James Bond, and it's just hilarious to see how he's so obsessed with like Sean Connery, and talking about all the Bond girls. And it's like okay. I can hang out with this guy. He's pretty cool. Very la relatable. Mm-hmm. So it's it's got a, it's a great soundtrack too. Like there was one point where he uh, he goes to London. There's a great track that plays. I was like I was jamming to it. I was like it's a great time capsule movie from the '90s, mid '90s movie. You seen the movie, Andy? Uh, I have. It's It's been a long time. Um, back to, gosh, when I was probably in my early 20s. Uh, I'm in my 30s now, to give you some perspective. Uh, so it, it's been it's been a little while since I've seen it. And uh, the last time I, well, it was like with a group of friends. And, yeah, we, we all had a little bit to drink. So, honestly, I don't recall it all that well anymore. <laughs> Uh, kind of a, a weird film to watch after having a few drinks. Uh, I mean, gosh, I completely forgot about that baby scene. Uh, it's just disturbing stuff. Oof. Yeah, so if you uh, like what you're hearing, check out Train Spotting. It's worth a watch. Uh, mm -hmm. Let's go to. I'm going to save myself for last. So, I would like to go to 2001 and talk about a romantic comedy from the UK, based on a book as well, Bridget mm -hmm. Jones' Diary, which a uh, third movie is coming out this year. Mm -hmm. And take it away, kiddo. Here was my exception. Yes, I love Bridget Jones' Diary. I have seen the movie, I read the book, I actually do own the second one, I can't find my copy though, but I own the first one, and I own the films, both the first and the second. And with Bridget Jones, the ironic twist is, because I have a funny story how I even discovered these films. I was at my grandma's, and my grandma likes my grandma and I like to watch um, a lot of romantic comedies together. That's our that's our shtick. That's what we love to do together. Um, we love to watch as many romantic comedies, and we both love Hugh Grant. We both love Colin Firth, and this just happened to be one of those movies that both of us really liked, and we watched it. And we had a great time with it. It was just one of those. It's a, romantic comedies, yes, are known to have a formula, but the fun thing about Bridget Jones is because of the because of the book, I really I read the book first again. Like I decided to reread the book before seeing the movie today, and and it's funny because the book has a completely different style than what you would expect. It's not. It, it does have a little bit of some subtle humor, but it's mainly about women who... It's mainly about this woman, well, Bridget Jones, who's this upset... Th like, this singly, this single woman who's obsessed with her looks, who's obsessed with her weight, who's obsessed with everything. Pretty much a teenage girl in her 30s, almost. She's kind of like that. She's an obsessed smoker, she's an obsessed drinker, she worries about her looks all the time, and she writes everything down about her day. Whether it's just little things like, oh, I just slept with this one guy, or um, I have, or my parents are going through this and I have to deal with it, or whatever. So she writes it down like a diary, and that's the whole point of the book. Um, what I like, that's what I liked about the book. It's not like an average book. It really is like a diary, and actually, the author herself, Helen Feeling really had inspiration from her own life, how she felt about being single in her 30s. So she kind of was using herself, only she exaggerated herself. Like, it's funny, on the, on the bottom of the book, it literally warns you, it says, health warning, adopting Bridget, Bridget's lifestyle could seriously damage your health. <laughs> and there's a good reason for that, because she's, like, in the book, 
she really says like she smokes like more than 22 cigarettes sometimes or jeez oh, or drinking 14 units of alcohol or whatever depending on the day and she writes her weight she writes her weight she writes her how much she smokes how much she eats everything she writes everything down and that's the whole point um but i i really liked the book because at least in the book you get a perspective of bridget herself she's that's exactly what she is very self-absorbed but at least she has a good heart well the movie was able to capture the spirit it was very very good and at, at capturing the spirit of this very clumsy kind of awkward bridget jones who is obsessed with everything i said before and and she's a terrible public speaker and i think it's funny how renee zellweger was able to play off this character so well she was able to play off this very awkward woman who clearly is just trying to find somebody special in her life she wants to get a boyfriend and she wants to find love but she's struggling immensely and then she meets then she's flirting with her boss who's played by hugh grant daniel mm -hmm. hugh, it, it's hugh grant come on how, how can, can you not like hugh grant exactly and Pop goes my heart <laughs> <Don't you start? laughs> that's a good movie by the way but off topic, um, I liked Daniel Cleaver's this like self-absorbed boss who is very egotistical and he will sleep with anyone, pretty much. And she has an attraction to him. And while well, they're doing a little flirtation for a while, and then she sleeps with him. And then some, and then she discovers that he's cheating on her with some other bimbo that they got engaged to. Yeah, that was kind of awkward. Then he... It was just sex. We don't, it doesn't have to mean anything. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like you care. I don't care. You don't care. Oh, I don't care. It could be like how it was before. Later. <laughs> okay. That was, okay, that that was actually pretty good because that is accurate. But um, then she also is sort of talking to this one guy that she doesn't like at first. Um, Mr. Darcy. Mark Darcy. All right, if you if this sounds familiar, this girl that Bridget meets is Mr. Darcy, who she doesn't like at first, and then throughout the book, as he proves his worth, she falls for him. Now, what book does that remind you of? What story reminds you of that? James, isn't Neal? that uh, Pride of Prejudice? Correct. Mm -hmm. Good job. And the new guy gets a thousand points. <laughs> Good job. Yes. <laughs> Funny enough, good job, that's actually why I brought that up, because in the book, there's actually a funny joke that Bridget talks about how she jokes around that Mr. Darcy looks like Colin Firth from the Pride and Prejudice TV movie. <laughs> and it's funny because Colin Firth is playing Mr. Darcy in the movies. That's actually mm -hmm. a huge joke. It, it, it's funnier when you read the book. And then see the movie because that cracked me up immensely. <laughs> it was a casting match made in heaven. It really was, and I think for me, even though I'm not a lover of like, I'm I mean I'm not into the really hard British stuff, but this book is really more in my type of more my type of thing. I'm more into romantic comedies. I'm more into. Um, I'm more into that, like romantic comedies. I'm not into prison break stuff. I'm not into like dramas, into like certain dra types of dramas. Like I'm not into certain types of comedies. But romantic comedies has always been my thing. That's always been a niche of mine. And it doesn't matter. Like I've seen a lot of like Bridget Jones and stuff. I didn't know this was a British movie. It never felt like one to me. It never felt British. But I think other than her accent which she does pretty well actually and <laughs> I guess why I like this movie is because it doesn't feel like a true British film even, and it does take place in London mind you all filmed in London and um, in the book is very British written in tone especially when you read and she writes like she puts her weight in nine pounds like nine Oh, nine stones, which is mm -hmm. nine stones instead of 
whatever our weight is here. Mm -hmm. Like how in pounds. Weight, yeah, exactly. We use pounds. They use stones. Fair enough. That makes sense. Yeah, because if because if, if you go to the UK and you talk about pounds, they think you're talking about money. Yeah, well, that's the point. And I get and I like that. It's not. It does feel like a British book, and I appreciate it for that. The movie was able to capture that spirit, but they did Americanize some of it, like writing 126 pounds or how much units of alcohol in Ameri in our in our system. That's fine. That's a, that's minor. I mean, I'm not gonna. As long as it captures the spirit of the book, that's all I cared about. But there is one thing in the book that they completely got rid of from the film. And that, there was this subplot in the book that, um, that there was this, like, their par like her parents were forging money. Her, mm -hmm. They were forging money, and they almost got into trouble for it. She was trying to, her mom was trying to escape and move to, like, Portugal or whatever. And she found out. And they completely get rid of the subplot from the book, and instead make it in the typical romantic comedy formula where the guy finds out that she really hated him but she and there's a bit of a misunderstanding she runs out in her underwear no joke <laughs> that's, <laughs> too, that's the part that uh, gets gets the boyfriend in the seat <laughs> <laughs> you know what whatever well, she's running out trying to tell him what happened, why she wrote it that way or whatever, and he actually, at the end of the movie, is um, showing that he bought her a new diary for the new year. Oh. And she wrote a diary from that previous year. So he knew that she wrote for because she wrote a diary. So, for me, I think I mean, I'm sort of torn whether I like the movie that the way they did it or not. But I really liked Bridget Jones because it just didn't feel like the movie didn't feel like a British movie. It felt like the type of romantic comedy that I really like. And, and I like the book a lot because it does give me a little bit of an appreciation for some of the British stuff, like for Britain style humor. I think the book did that better than the film did. But um, like I said, I'm very picky. I'm very, very picky on certain types of humor. But I, but I like, I really liked these films over, I liked the book overall, and I am very much thrilled that I own the two films, because I actually saw the, ironically, I saw the second one first, and I <laughs> didn't know that was the first, she thought that was the first one, not the second one. Well, so, I saw the films backwards with her, but it happens. But then, yes, Mike is right, there is actually a third film coming out in September. And that is Bridget Jones' Bridget Jones's Baby, which I just did research, and this is not based off of her th the third book that Helen Fielding wrote. Mm. They, it's a completely new story. They decided to use instead of um instead of the the book I haven't read it yet, but it's about like she loses her husband Mark Darcy from some weird either accident or whatever. And instead, um, and she's talking about like how she can't get Twitter followers and stuff like that in the book. I really haven't read it, so I can't tell you anything. Um, but um, in the movie, but the movie they're doing for the third one, they're actually doing. They want to do this plot where she is like she's dating Mark Darcy, but then they break up, and then she meets the, another guy played by Patrick Dempsey. That is hilarious and ironic. And then she then she gets pregnant and she doesn't know who the father is. <laughs> oh. Just out of so curiosity, they, is it is it um like isn't the new movie with Renee Zellweger? Yeah. Also? Yeah, because honestly, well, they've like, all that's got the, Renee Zellweger. Oh, yeah, well, Renee well yeah, but no but the one thing I am surprised about is that it's literally been so many years since I've heard about Renee Renee Zellweger in general, actually. Because it felt like somewhere in the early 2000s she was a big star, and then suddenly she disappeared, and then suddenly only recently she made a comeback. Yeah, that's true. Or at true. least she like she reappeared in the news. Yeah, cause she took a hiatus. It was like, uh, I'm looking at her at Wikipedia. I think she took a hiatus. I think she had a kid, didn't she? Uh, I, I believe so. 
Oh. Yeah, that tends to that tends to do it. Yeah, because yeah, like I said, they apparently announced they were people were skept speculating whether they were going to make a third movie based off of the book, but apparently the book didn't do very well, and that's probably why a lot of people don't remember it. Like the first two are Edge of Reason and Bridget Jones Diary are huge successes or not huge successes but they're successes um but the third one completely fell from the market and nobody suspected it to become a movie but then i think the same people who created the first two had been in debate about making a third bridget jones's movie and they decided to completely scrap the book idea and just write a new story and hugh grant wasn't willing to come back for the third film and that's why patrick dempsey was now casted so it's kind of amusing. I'm very intrigued. Well, what you want to do with this? So we'll see. Well, what, and that, and why would you want to kill off Mr. Darcy? <laughs> that is true. I mean, it's Colin Firth, but shush. And I mean, like, like I, like I said, I, I, and I did like, like I love Hugh Grant. Colin Firth is pretty good. I really do like some of his. I really do like his acting in that movie, and in. My other one I love him in is the Pride and Prejudice TV adaptation. Great movie, by the way. And Let's not forget Mamma Mia. You know, uh. I, 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 I'm going to hurt you for that one. Of course. <laughs> Don't... But Pierce Brosnan, though. Oh. Pierce Brosnan was worse in that movie, but I digress. I digress. Um... <laughs> that is a great... <laughs> thank, you, thank you for that segue, by the way. That's a great segue into the next and last feature. Well, yeah, I didn't, I didn't actually, well, I didn't actually um, get to say my my piece on Bridget Jones. It's fine, it's fine. Go ahead, go. I know, I'll bring it up later. So go, 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 go. My deal with it is my deal with Bridget Jones. I didn't see it at first, but my introduction to whatever remains of the story. You're not gonna believe what spoof movie I, I watched. What was it? Date movie. Damn. <laughs> well, that sounds like a. I haven't seen date movie, but that sounds like that movie was trying to rip off a lot of the romantic. Yeah, comedy. it was. I seen it too, actually. I think I had it on DVD at one point, so it was. Oh, why? Why would you? <laughs> you owned it. I okay. owned it at one point. Yeah, I don't have it anymore, but. I remember watching it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. They, yeah. the The whole joke in there is that the character's name is Julia Jones. She she has a diary where she writes about wanting to find true love, and her deal is she's the big joke is she's fat. Oh yeah, and then she's like she has like some fat. kind of liposuction and like it was never brought up again. Yes. Yes. I need because to, I'm. Yeah, because liposuction apparently cures you of, uh, also of your eating habits. I can't say anything further than that. I mean, like, I, yeah, I just pretty much said all my thoughts on the movie. I would recommend it if you are a romantic comedy lover, mainly. Or if you like Renee Zellweger, Hugh Grant, and Colin Firth. I mean, that's just me. I would recommend it from, definitely would recommend it from oh. That's I'll just have to mine. save it for a date. Yeah, yeah, date movie. That's a perfect date movie. <laughs> Look, men, if you're smart and you date a woman who loves romantic comedies, this is one of them. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. And the third Writing it down. Out, so Writing it down. Pay. Note to self. <laughs> hey, Note to self. Out. Date someone. Date someone who doesn't like romantic movies. <laughs> <laughs> Pow. Thank you, James. Because Matt, you're doing this again. This is your common theme. Oh no! <laughs> oh no! See, that's the that's the American way. You got to use the British sign, which is the backwards peace sign. I'm not doing that shit like this. Yep, that's their oh, that's really? their version. That's right. You yep. know what, Matt? This is for you. Yep. That's for having the queen on the dollar bill. 
<laughs> Anarchy in the UK. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah, at least we have a woman in our dollar bill. We're getting Harriet Tubman, though. <laughs> oh my god. Oh my god, oh my god. Oh, you guys are killing me. Okay, um, so... How much Mike? time? Okay, I could, I could do this. I could do this. Okay, I could do this in 12 minutes. Okay, 12 minutes or less. Okay. Uh, so, my movie is from 1980. It's called The Long Good Friday. It is regarded as one of the best British films to date. Uh, besides... Um, lock, stock, and smoke, two smoking barrels because someone reviewed that and it's like, oh, it's the best movie since Long, the good, Long Good Friday. Um, so the Long Good Friday is a British gangster film. Yes, one of the first kinds of its... Because the director and the people behind it wanted to make a gangster film. You know, they were inspired by the American gangster films with Humping Bogart and all that stuff. So they wanted to Humping write... Humping Bogart? <laughs> Shut <laughs> Uh, Humphrey Bogart. God, can I just... Yeah, you can't even speak that right. Humphrey Bogart. Pronounce it slowly. Mr. Mixed Okay. Yes. <laughs> I can speak slowly to Mr. We speak well. Thank you, sir! <laughs> and how ironic that this is coming from Devin. <laughs> oh my god, fuck me in the ass. Oh, bloody hell. Whoa. It's about damn time you said so, Mike! <laughs> oh my god. I'd, I'd ship these two. Uh... Oh, no, Mike. Do it! Do it! Do it. <laughs> I'm sorry. Okay. Okay, Long Good Friday, we were saying. Oh, yes. Honestly, I totally forgot it. it's an Easter movie. It takes place on Good Friday. And it's Long Good Friday. Oddly enough. Mm hmm. Um, so it stars Bob Hoskins. Uh, Helen Mirren. Uh, I think that's it, actually. The most top two casting. Um, and? Oh, shoot, no, I'm saving that bit for... Yeah, I know, I know. There, there's a surprise little uh, uh, directorial... Uh, not directorial. Acting debut. But uh, the film is interesting. I was I had to rewatch it again. Cause I watched it last night with uh, James, and I kind of fell asleep to it because I don't know. It's not boring in a way, but it's just it's interesting enough how they make Harold, played by uh, Bob Hoskins, this British gangster, without making it so gangster-like. Because when you think of gangsters, you think of you know we have the mob, and there's guns, and there's shooting, and there's meh. <laughs> Yeah, this was a pretty this was a pretty downplayed uh, gangster movie. Not not that that was a bad thing, but it was kind of it's you know it's interesting how the British has their own gangsters. Like it's not what we think in America. I think with Harold, his character, he there's pip, pip, a I say pip 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 pip. There's here we go. <laughs> there's he says he's a businessman because there's. I think there's a deal that he's he wanted to do with the Americans, the Yanks, as they would say. Uh, I don't know. I forgot what the deal was. It was like because he was there was a speech where it's like I'm not a politician. I'm I'm a businessman, and England's not a island anymore. It's a part of England. You know, London is like it's going to be the new European capital, and it's just like we're trying to merge these two different cities together and it's just like trying to make the you know I don't know what he was doing with that I don't know what deal was that was but he was, he's a businessman most likely but then all of a sudden something happens and when you watch the film you see the opening bit and it'll show you what happens and it'll, it'll, it'll explain at the end but without giving out, out too much away uh, something happens to Harold's like group all his friends and all his 
family in a way. Like, they're all getting killed off one by one, and it's like, Oi! What bloody hell is this? What's going on here? Who's killing off everybody I know? So, it's up to him to figure out who's done this and how to stop it. And it just, you, you kind of follow him as he, you know, it's like a mystery in a way. Like, you kind of figure it out, but if you pay attention during the film, you kind of know what happened because it's all at the beginning and it leads up to a nice build up. Uh, Bob Hoskins, I, I, the only reason why I watched this because I, first off, it was like noted as the best British film. Um, and then Bob Hoskins, like, I, once I was watching the trailer and all of a sudden I hear Bob Hoskins, like, London English accent and it's just like, <laughs> oh my god. I was like, okay, I'm watching this because I've seen Bob Hoskins in his American acting roles, you know, when he's done his Brooklyn accent, you know, it's famously known in Roger Rabbit, uh, Super Mario Bros., and all that stuff, and I'm just like, okay, this is the true Bob Hoskins, this is the true blue Bob Hoskins, and I was like, I was loving it, he was into it, like, the director wanted him for the part, and he was perfect for the role, he says he was, he yells in it, you know, he's all pissed and it's just like oh it's so beautiful to watch him in action like this is one of his best roles to date like oh my god um helen mirren uh at first uh her character victoria i believe her name is she uh they originally wanted to have a dumbed down like mob wife kind of thing but helen mirren's like oh no 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 i want a intelligent woman who can deal with harold stuff and much more and they didn't rewrite anything so they just developed her as the movie went on so that was kind of interesting to, to figure that out she's she is so young oh my god i can't believe she's <laughs> <laughs> yeah she was young at one point this is the uh <laughs> this is the post caligula helen mirren oh that's right i totally forgot about that oh my god <laughs> oh lord um... how about that bit of film trivia yeah I totally forgot about it. So here's the surprising thing about this movie, which I did not know, and I showed James this last night, and he was like surprised by it too. Uh, there's there's a acting debut by one Pierce Bronson. Brosnan. <laughs> Thank you. We're not we're not watching Charles Bronson here. It's Pierce so, Brosnan. 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 Austin. Thank you. Brosnan. <laughs> you don't see this, but I'm flipping you guys off. Fuck you guys. <laughs> Sorry, what? Can't see anything. Exactly, you don't see nothing. Uh, yes. <laughs> he had a non-speaking role, but it was first, first acting debut in this film. You see him kill off one of the guys, he's like a agent for an uh, organization. What was he? It was an IRA, I think it was called. I forgot what the organization was. That They're the main group they, that Harold finds out that's been behind most of these uh, killings and all that stuff. It's it's It builds up really good because you find out what really happens and how they get resolved. And there's bombs and there's stabbings there's it's it's car bombs and explosions and people getting killed and all that it, it was just like but at the end the end like the end it was i was watching i was like oh my god the finale just it was amazing how one thing led to another and it went boom 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 it was it's a decent movie the pacing's quite all right the uh the, like I said, Bob Hoskins, like, he, he, he steals the whole movie. He steals the whole fucking movie. Like, if you love him as an actor, you have to see this movie to see his early roles as Harold here. He's, he's like, <laughs> it's so funny because he's like, at one point he's like, my friend Colin got stabbed and there was a car bombing and there's, there's a, there's now there's a bomb in me casino and it's just like, <laughs> He's all over the place when he gets pissed. You don't want to mess with him because he just he turns into this British Hulk in a way, just like yells and screams and just like whoa, whoa. 
this is this is Hoskins at 150 percent right here. Yes. Yes. We we've gone in our Baba Hoskins episode. We talked about how he he always gave 110 percent. This yeah. is 150. Yes, like it's it's up there. It's like it's that over the top. But it's just like it's it's he does get emotional too. I think there's he does great emotional scenes in there too. There's one point where that there's like a little fight that breaks up between two people, and he breaks a bottle and he does something with the bottle, and it's just like and he's at the end of it, it's like he's like crying. It's like oh, what have I done? It was. It was wow. I was like, there's one scene. They were trying to find people who, who wanted to know the answers to what happened, and they gather these people and they put them in this meat locker, and they hang them upside down because Harold's like, you know, trying to torture them in a way, kind of like be hung upside down to give me the answers. And there's a shot where you actually there's a POV and you're actually upside down with the people. You see oh. everything's upside down. It was a great shot. Like I was like I was watching. I was like, wait, did my phone did my phone rotate or something? Like why is it upside down? Because I was watching on my phone, and I was just like, what the heck's going on? And I was like, oh, it's upside down for a reason. I was like, wow, that's there's really upside cool. down everything all over town, and it looks so funny that I've got to frown. <laughs> so, it's if you like, I I I. I, I truly loved it. I thought it was really cool. I, it's, it's got a great legacy. It's like people still remember this movie. Actually, I discovered that last year it was restored and it was released in theaters for a limited time. So I was just like, whoa, okay. It's got that kind of legacy where it could be restored and released in theaters for a limited time. I was like, it's, I mean, you got Bob Hoskins, you got an early uh, role of Pierce Bronson. And, uh... <laughs> Pierce Brosnan, you fool! <laughs> he, did, he, did, he did speak it slowly. It was... Very terrible. <laughs> it was kind of amazing. He said, Bronson. <laughs> James, what did you think about the film since you saw it with me? I wanted to finish it actually, and unfortunately, like uh, uh, like I said, it it was very slow moving. And when 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 we watched it last night, I would just gotten home from watching Suicide Squad, and it's a two hour long, two or lo- two hour long movie, and uh, I just gotten done watching a a really high energy two hour long movie with this really slow moving two hour long movie. But that doesn't mean it was. Uh, that doesn't mean it was a bad. It was a bad film. Now, I, I always like. I always like some. I always like me some Hoskins. But uh, uh, I remember when we were watching it, there was one point where I just sort of looked at the. Uh, he had his head turned to the camera, and I realized. I was like, "Whoa! He has this. He has a balding spot right in the same place as I do." <laughs> and Mike was like. I want Bob Hoskins' hair. <laughs> <laughs> because I'm I'm balding too, and he's got more hair than me. I just felt like, God damn, can I have that hair too? I mean, that bald spot in the back is okay, but can I have more? You just want you just want more hair, don't you? <laughs> I mean, you're hairier than me, Matt. What are you talking about? Yeah, That's hairier it. than the rest of us. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm not gonna comment on that. So. I got three people's. I got three. Ha- I got three people's hairs worth. <laughs> Hi, Wolfman. I I don't know. Well, well, actually, we don't we don't quite know yet. I mean, Andy could uh, could very well be a rug underneath, and we just don't know because we're looking at his head. <laughs> I just, I just concentrated all of my hair just right here. Just concentrated ball of hair right there. <laughs> all his hair energy is going here. Yeah, it's just right there. I have too much. I have too much hair energy, and I have to. I have to focus everywhere, or else if it goes on one section, then like, I might end up with a Merlin beard. You know. <laughs> oh my 
He can just he can just zoom a kazoo. <laughs> I want your attention, everything. <laughs> I, I, I thought I was mad. Apparently, no. I'm just gonna. I'm in. I'm in Wonderland or something. Oh, you're always in Wonderland with me. I'm from Wonderland. That is true. <laughs> well, with me, she's in Neverland. So, ha. Huh. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's. I'm either young or beautiful or crazy. I know on birthday gifts for you. <laughs> <laughs> you little asshole. Whoa. Okay. <laughs> You're the one who chooses to never grow up. Oh, <laughs> 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 I'm going to die. I'm going to die of laughter. <laughs> I was going to say, Matt chose to be psychotic, James chose to never grow up, and I chose to be either one depending on the day. I get mm -hmm. to, I get out of jail for free. I mean, I learned that from Matt. If you want something, you can get out of jail for free. <laughs> yeah, just, you just have to know who to hold at gunpoint. That's true, that's always usually my first, and then I come back. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Aren't they funny? <laughs> yeah. Yes. As you were saying, Wolfman. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, uh, the Long Good Friday is, yes, like James said, is is almost two hours long. Is uh, it does build up kind of slowly because it's a lot of dialogue and then the action, the little action that it is. There's mostly just like stabbings and bombs and all that stuff. It, it takes a while, but it's worth the build-up, because you understand what the character's going through and how each little element goes by, you know? It's kind of clever if you just pay attention to from the beginning to the end. It's like, oh, oh, that whole sequence at the beginning that ties into the end is like, ah, oh, I get it now. Oh, well, that'll, that'll be a good, uh, It'll be a good thing to notice uh, when I rewatch the film is whether or not, uh, you know, what I missed in the beginning, or yeah. if I missed anything. Yeah, you'll uh, you'll uh, probably notice a few things, and at the end, it's it's worth it because the ending's just like <laughs> Harold solves the problem. One thing leads to another, and then a twist comes about. Yes, there's a twist in the movie. I'm not going to reveal it, because I thought it was, like, surprising. It's just, I was like, whoa! What? What? <laughs> like, hmm. it's, it's... It's worth a uh, decent watch if you like Bob Hoskins. I mean, if you want to check out his early work, it's definitely worth the price of admission for that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And... Uh, I mean, British films as a whole, there's so many others, other films out there from the UK, there's just, we just scratched the little bit of surface that there is when it comes to British films. There's others, there's, there's, there might be some British action films, there might be some British crime dramas, there might be British animation, there might be British romantic dramas, they try to... got enough for a part two. <laughs> there's enough for a part two in the future. There's enough for everything when it comes to British films. Oh uh, yeah, they they do so they do things so amazingly differently over there. You know they actually use twenty five frames a second in the film instead of twenty four. Huh. <laughs> That's interesting. It is well, and also a... like and don't forget about the PAL format, which is like like one pitch higher. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Usually, when you take a when you take a an American film and and uh, uh, speed it up in the PAL format, that's what happens. <laughs> yeah. Uh, comment below. What is your favorite British film? Give this video a like if you like it. Please share this if you have British friends out there who are interested to see our opinions with five Yanks talking about British films? Who knows? People might like it. This is Who knows? We might even bring in an actual British person. <laughs> yeah, next time. 
one day, one day we will have a British guest. One day we will have a British guest. I thought it would be neat to have someone who dabs into foreign flicks and promote the hell out of the guy because he's worth every little drop. <laughs> mm hmm So thank you, yeah. Andy, for coming on. Thank you, and just check this guy out. He is truly, truly amazing. Oh, yeah. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure. And uh, with that, thanks for listening to Cinema Royale. Uh, next time, I won't be on the episode, 80th episode. I'm going to take a little break. I'm going on vacation. But these fools, these co-hosts, are going to try to do an episode without me. Hopefully, knock on wood, it's going to be a decent one. Uh, Morgan's going to do that. So you'll see Morgan hosting it. I give him the reins of it. And it's going to be about midnight movies. So... It's going to be a little different. But I will see you guys in four weeks when we take on a little adventure, if you know what I mean. Mmm. Little tease for the 81st episode, too. Uh, yep. Thanks for listening, and good night. See you later, dudes. Jerry. Oh, and, uh, Jerry, I might. Ciao for now. Yeah. Don't forget to kiss your bum goodbye. <laughs> You're supposed to blow the bloody doors off. What's his bloody problem, not mine? <laughs> no! And we're done.